Did you know that reading to your brain is like exercise to your body? Reading is one of the best things you can do to improve your fluency in English. And that's why I'm so excited to share this two hour reading lesson with you. Welcome back to J4S English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. First, I'll read the headline. By turning Twitter into X, Elon Musk risks killing billions in brand value. Did you hear that Twitter is no longer called Twitter? It is now called X. So as you can see on this platform, this is the logo, the new X logo, which replaces the bird that everybody knows from Twitter. So by turning Twitter into X, in this case, when you turn something into something, it means you transform it or you change it. So Elon Musk transformed Twitter into X. It is no longer Twitter. It is now called X. I wrote that definition for you. And here's an everyday example. I turned these old towels into a beautiful quilt. So I took these old towels and I transformed them. I changed them into a beautiful quilt. Now don't worry about writing all these notes down because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. So you can look in the description for the link to download the free lesson PDF. And notice here in the headline, we have Elon Musk risks and then you have a verb, but what do you notice about the verb? It's in the gerund form, the ing form. That's because the verb risk is a gerund verb. So the verb that comes after risk will be in the ing form. For example, I could say you can't risk and now whatever verb I need is going to be in the gerund. So you can't risk what? missing the meeting, for example, or you can't risk missing this lesson that you're watching right now. So notice this verb is in the ing form because risk is a gerund verb. All right, let's continue on and learn about how Elon Musk turned Twitter into X. It's rare for corporate brands to become so intertwined with everyday conversation that they become verbs. And this is actually really interesting that they said this, that they become verbs. For example, the company Google, you commonly use this as a verb. I Googled it, just Google it. You're taking the company name and you're actually using it as a verb, which is something that we do with very popular social media sites. So you can use Google as a verb, but remember because it's a verb, you have to conjugate it with your time reference. I Googled it, that's in the past. Or she WhatsApped me. Sometimes when it doesn't look very good to spell it as an ED, we do an apostrophe D to show the past simple. She WhatsApped me. He retweeted my picture. All of these are verbs and all of them are in the past simple. It's rarer still. Listen to the pronunciation here. Rarer, rarer. So we have rare. Er, rarer. It's rarer still for the owner of such a brand to announce plans to intentionally destroy it. So Elon Musk intentionally destroyed Twitter by rebranding it as the company X. Now, when you do something intentionally, this is an adverb and it means that you did it on purpose on purpose. So Elon Musk intentionally destroyed the brand Twitter. He wanted to do it. It was planned. It was on purpose. So intentionally is the adverb. You can also use it as an adjective and you can say it was intentional. 
It was intentional. So this is as the adjective to be intentional. It was intentional. It being the decision or the action that you just did. So he intentionally did it. It was intentional. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. On Sunday, Elon Musk decreed, decree, this is a verb and it's an official statement that something must happen. When someone decrees something, it sounds very strong, but it also sounds extremely official. I usually hear this in the context of government agencies decreeing certain rules or regulations, but here Elon Musk is the boss of a company, so he has the ability to decree. Now, as another example, my company decreed that we have to work on Saturday. So your company officially said that this must happen. You must work on Saturday. On Sunday, Elon Musk decreed that Twitter's product name would be changed to X. So now if you go on Twitter, it's not called Twitter anymore. It's called X. Actually, I wonder what the website is. Is it www.x.com? I don't know. Let me know in the comments because I haven't tried to go on Twitter since this has happened. So I wonder what the URL is, the website is. Okay, would be changed to X and that he is getting rid of the bird. Oh no, the famous Twitter bird. I like this bird. It's cute. Oh, well, he's getting rid of it. When you get rid of something, it means that you permanently remove it. So you can get rid of items from your home, items you don't need anymore or don't want anymore, and you permanently remove those items from your home. A lot of times they will go into the garbage, but they could also be given to someone else or sold or donated. So it doesn't have to go in the garbage, but a lot of the times it does. So he's getting rid of the bird. Now notice that the action is in the present continuous. He's getting rid of the bird, which means he's doing it now, which also means it's not a completed action. So maybe if you go onto Twitter or X, www.x.com, you will see the bird still because he's getting rid of it. It's in the present continuous. In the past simple, it would be he got rid of the bird. He got rid of the bird. That would be a completed action. He got rid of the bird. Okay, the poor bird. Let's continue. The bird logo. <laughs> the bird logo and all the associated words, including tweet. This is what the article mentioned at the beginning where you can use tweet as a verb. I tweeted what I did last night. I tweeted my holiday photos, whatever you might tweet. Musk's move wiped out anywhere between $4 billion and $20 billion in value. Now notice, I read this, $4 billion and $20 billion. I could absolutely read dollars for each one, but it's not required. You can just use one dollars verbally. But notice you do, you verbally say dollars after the amount and the the denomination. So 100 million billion, that's the denomination. 20 billion dollars, that's how you say it orally. 
And notice billion, there is no S, but dollars, this is where you verbally say S with in plural, dollars. Dollars, that's how you say it orally. Okay, his move, his strategic move. His move, this is simply saying what he's planning to do. Musk's move wiped out. Wipe out, this means to eliminate, but it has the, the feeling like it happened quickly. Oh, they wiped it out. They eliminated it. They got rid of it and it happened quite quickly or dramatically. So his move wiped out anywhere between $4 billion and $20 billion in value, according to analysts and brand agencies. It took 15 plus years. When you see this 15 plus, it can be written as plus, as an actual word, or you can use the plus simple, symbol and you can say 15 plus years years. So in this case, if you use the symbol, you don't have a dash. It would just be 15 plus because technically the dash looks like a minus sign. <laughs> so you, that would be very confusing. 15 plus years or as, as they have it here, 15 dash plus. It took 15 plus years. And of course that means more than 15 years. So when you say 15 plus, maybe it's 16 or 17, but because we generally like to talk in numbers of zero and five, it sounds better to say 15 plus rather than 16. And you see this a lot on resumes or people talking about their experience. I have 15 plus years of experience teaching English, for example. It took 15 plus years to earn that much equity worldwide. The equity is referring to the value, the company's value. And this is just the equity that they wiped out, that they eliminated by turning Twitter into X. The company is obviously worth more than that if, if the move wiped this much out. So the equity is how much it is worth. And it took 15 plus years to earn that much equity worldwide. So losing Twitter as a brand name is a significant financial hit. In this case, the word hit means loss, loss. So you could say we took a hit during COVID. This means you had a financial loss during COVID, especially in the context of a business. In a context of a business, we, this means my business, our business. So our company, our business took a hit during COVID. That means financially. You can use this in an everyday context. If you don't have a company as well, you might say, well, we sold our home, but we took a hit. We took a hit, which means you lost financially on the sale of your home. So you didn't make as much money as you could have made if you had sold it at a different time. For example, oh, we sold our home, but we took a hit. We took a hit. Okay, so losing Twitter as a brand name is a significant financial hit said Steve Susi, Director of Brand Communication. Musk, whose company has already declined significantly in value since he purchased it for $44 billion in October. $44 billion. So this is how much he purchased it for. And this one person is suggesting that he just lost almost half the value of the company by turning Twitter into X. Of course, that is just this one person's dis opinion. It doesn't mean that this is factual. It's simply his, his opinion. Okay, so he purchased it for $44 billion. Remember that S on dollars, dollars in October. 
announced the change on Saturday night. Now, when you see this comma here and then another comma here, what's happening is all of this is just additional information in the, in the sentence. Let me see if I can move this here just to make it a little more clear because how you read this grammatically is here, this announced is going to be conjugated with musk. Now, because it's in the past simple, there isn't a different conjugation for different subjects. So that's pretty easy. But if this were in the present simple, you wouldn't conjugate it with whatever you last saw here. You would conjugate it with whatever came before the first comma. Musk announced the change on Saturday night. That right there is a complete sentence. And then everything in the commas gives additional information. So information about when he bought the company and how much it was worth at the time. So that's a very important point to remember, especially when you're writing. So Musk and then this word is conjugated with Musk. Now here, let's take a look at significantly because they used it twice. Significant financial hit. Here, this is being used as an adjective, a significant financial hit. And then significantly is an adverb. Significant, significantly are both more formal, advanced ways of saying a big or a lot. So I have significant experience. I have a lot of experience. Twitter took a significant financial hit. Twitter took a big financial hit. So it can mean big in quantity or a lot, depending on how it's used in context, but it is a more advanced way. If I were in a job interview, I would not say I have a lot of experience. I would say I have significant experience because that sounds a lot more professional than saying a lot. I have a lot of experience, but when I'm communicating with my friends, I would absolutely use a lot because significant sounds too formal for communication with my friends. So I have a lot of experience. This means I have significant experience. Okay. Let's continue by Monday morning, a new black X logo. So remember, that's what we saw in the image here. So if you log into Twitter now, oh, look, I'm just noticing underneath. He does have the URL x.com. Oh, I just answered my own question. Okay. X.com. Interesting. So here, this is the new black X logo that appeared on, what was it? on Monday morning, a new black X logo designed by a fan over the weekend began to appear across the site. All right. New chief executive officer. So chief executive officer, this is the highest ranking position within a company commonly use the short form CEO. So the abbreviation, you take the first letter of each to form the abbreviation, chief executive officer, CEO. So new CEO, Linda Yaccarino, outlined the company's vision for X to become a site for audio, video, messaging, payments, and banking. So it looks like with this rebrand, by turning Twitter into X, it appears based on what we're reading now that Elon wants to also expand what the company does. And it won't just be a social media platform if you can do your payments and banking. This is interesting because did you know that Elon Musk started PayPal. PayPal was his company. He invented it. And PayPal is of course payments and banking. So Elon Musk already has a lot of experience in that area because he invented PayPal. So I guess that makes sense that he wants to combine what he did with PayPal into 
social media and have it as one site. All right. So that's interesting to know. Analysts and brand agencies call the products renaming a mistake. So renaming, when you add re in front of a verb, it means to do it again. So the verb is to name, to name a company, to name a website. But so they first originally named it Twitter and now they're renaming it. They're naming it again to X. Analysts and brand agencies call the products renaming a mistake. Twitter is one of the most recognizable social media brands, said Todd Irwin, founder of brand agency Phaser. Bird decals adorn small businesses and websites worldwide. What's a decal? Well, it's basically a sticker but it's slightly different material. It's a picture and you put it onto a surface just like you would put a sticker, but it doesn't stick the same way that a sticker does. So the way it sticks to the surface is different from a sticker, but is the exact same concept. It is an image that you can place on a surface. So here are some fun flower decals that you could put on your car. And I'm sure there are all types of decals to suit your preferences. If you want to put them on your car or put them on your window or wherever you want to put them. So that's a decal. And I'm sure you've seen the Twitter bird decal different places, maybe on laptops when you're in a cafe and people have the Twitter bird on their laptop. That's a decal. It could also be a sticker. It just depends how it is on the surface, if it's a sticker or a decal. Bird decals adorn small businesses and websites worldwide. Adorn, it simply is a formal way of saying they're visible on. So you can see the decals on small businesses and websites alongside Instagram and Facebook logos. Twitter's popularity has also made verbs like tweet and retweet. I tweeted you. Did you get it? Did you get my tweet? We also use it as a noun, of course. Did you see my tweet? So in that case, it's a noun. Did you see my tweet? I didn't know, know you tweeted me. So this would be the verb. And this is a noun form. Twitter's popularity has also made verbs like tweet and retweet part of modern culture used regularly to explain how celebrities, politicians, and others communicated with the public, said Joshua White, assistant professor of finance at Vanderbilt University. And that's the end of the article. So I wonder what they'll say now. Did you see my... X? <laughs> Is that what they'll say? Did you see my X? I didn't know you. What would it be? X'd me? So this is where it it, I don't know. It doesn't look the best to do X E D. So this is where a native speaker would do the X apostrophe D to show that it's in the past simple. I didn't know you X'd me. Is that what they're going to say now? I have no idea, but that is the logo and the website. And if we say tweet, I guess it makes sense. We would now say X. So we'll see how Elon Musk will also modify and change the English language at the same time he does the social media platform Twitter. So that is the end of the article. So what I'll do now is I'll go to the beginning and I'll read the article from start to finish. And this time you can focus on my pronunciation. By turning Twitter into eggs, Elon Musk risks killing billions in brand value. It's rare for corporate brands to become so intertwined with everyday conversation that they become verbs. It's rarer still for the owner of such a brand to announce plans to intentionally destroy it. 
On Sunday, Elon Musk decreed that Twitter's product name would be changed to X and that he is getting rid of the bird logo and all the associated words, including tweet. Musk's move wiped out anywhere between $4 billion and $20 billion in value, according to analysts and brand agencies. It took 15 plus years to earn that much equity worldwide. So losing Twitter as a brand name is a significant financial hit, said Steve Susi, director of brand communication. Musk, whose company has already declined significantly in value since he purchased it for $44 billion in October, announced the change on Saturday night. By Monday morning, a new Black X logo, designed by a fan over the weekend, began to appear across the site. New Chief Executive Officer Linda Yaccarino outlined the company's vision for X to become a site for audio, video, messaging, payments, and banking. Analysts and brand agencies call the product's renaming a mistake. Twitter is one of the most recognizable social media brands, said Todd Irwin, founder of brand agency Phaser. Bird decals adorn small businesses and websites worldwide, alongside Instagram and Facebook logos. Twitter's popularity has also made verbs like tweet and retweet part of modern culture used regularly to explain how celebrities, politicians, and others communicated with the public, said Joshua White, assistant professor of finance at Vanderbilt University. Amazing job. Feel free to take a break. And when you're ready, let's move on with the next article. Welcome to our article. We're talking about TikTok. I'm sure an app you're very familiar with. Let me read the headline. Agencies have 30 days to ban TikTok on government devices, White House says. So this article is about banning TikTok. You need to know what ban means to understand the context of this article. Ban is a verb and it means to not allow or to prohibit. Now, of course, this article is about government, the government banning TikTok and the government allows and doesn't allow bans many different things. Not just the government, for example, there are many times. Imagine you go to the airport. There are many things or activities that are banned at an airport that are not allowed. For example, smoking. Smoking is banned in all airports. Now notice here, I'm using my verb to be and then I'm using ban in the ED form. Notice the spelling. You add an extra N when it's in the ED form. This does not affect pronunciation at all. Smoking is banned. I could use an active sentence and I could talk about who banned smoking at airports. For example, the airport authority assuming there is one, the airport authority banned smoking. This verb ban is commonly used in the passive form as well, because a lot of times we're just talking about the result. We're not necessarily talking about who is banning something. So how could I take this sentence and put it in the passive form? What do you think? I'll give you a second. Let me write it out for you in the passive form. So I can take my active sentence, the airport authority bans smoking. So I'm now, I'm going to take smoking is going to be my subject. Smoking, my verb in the active form is in the past simple. So now all I have to do is turn it into the passive form, which needs the verb to be. And that is going to be in the past simple. Smoking was banned. I'm going to leave ban in the ED form. Smoking was banned by the airport authority. So that's my passive sentence. So you can use the verb ban 
in an active sentence and it's very commonly used in the passive sentence as well. Let me read the headline again. Agencies have 30 days to ban. TikTok on government devices, White House says. So this is an order coming from the White House. All right, let's continue on. The White House has directed federal agencies that they have 30 days to remove TikTok from all government issued devices. So again, here they're removing TikTok because the government has banned TikTok. I could say that as just a statement, the government has banned TikTok. Notice here, notice here that I used which verb tense? I used the present perfect verb tense. Let me see if I can put this in capitals and if it will correct the spelling. Ah, it likes that. It likes it in capitals. Tick tock. This is in the present perfect. Now, why did I put this sentence in the present perfect when I said it out loud? The government has banned TikTok. It's because it's an action that's a completed action. The government has banned TikTok, so you need to remove it from your device. It's a completed past action, but it has a result in the present. Completed past action with a result in the present. And the result in the present is, so now you have to remove it from your device. That's why I put this in the present perfect when I said it out loud. 30 days to remove TikTok. Now keep in mind, this isn't the general public. This is only for government issued devices. So if you have a phone but the government, your job, your employer gave you this phone, you have to remove TikTok from this phone. But let's say you have another phone that's your personal phone. Well, you wouldn't have to remove it. You would only have to remove TikTok from your government issued phone. Okay, here we go. We'll continue on. U.S. officials have raised concerns that the Chinese government could pressure ByteDance to hand over information. Let me just pause there. I want to just point out our verb here, have raised concerns. You can raise a concern. Oh, I have a concern that I'd like to raise at the next meeting. So it's just another way of saying to share, to share a concern. Let me write the sentence I just said. I have a concern that I'd like to raise. Again, this is another way of just saying I'd like to share. Or you could say, you raised a valid concern in the meeting. A valid concern is simply a concern that we should consider further. It's a nice way of saying a good concern. A good concern, that sounds like very beginner English. A valid concern. It's a concern we should consider. It's a way of saying, I think your concern is a good concern. U.S. officials have raised concern that the Chinese government could pressure ByteDance. ByteDance, they actually don't explain it in the article, but ByteDance is the company that owns TikTok, if you weren't sure who ByteDance was. The company that owns TikTok. So the Chinese government could pressure ByteDance. When one the Chinese government pressures another, it means they try to get them to do something specific. I wrote the definition here. Now let me share an example sentence. My coworker pressured me to stay late to help him. So remember, we have one 
my coworker, then we have our verb pressure here. It's in the past simple because it's a completed action. Maybe I'm talking about something that happened yesterday and then one pressures one, one pressures another. So the other is me, my coworker pressured me. And this is what he tried to get me to do. He tried to get me to stay late to help him. So maybe my workday ends at five o'clock, but my coworker said, Oh, please. I really need your help. Remember I helped you last week. So it would be really great if you could stay stay late and help me. It will look really good. If you do, if you don't, I'll tell other people you're not a team player. So those are the ways that someone could press you. you usually with an argument, it could also be by trying to offer you something as well. So the Chinese government could pressure bright dance the owners of TikTok to hand over information. When you hand something over, it means you simply provide it. So you provide information here to give something to someone to give is to provide. It's just a different way of saying it. But notice I wrote often because you're required to. So a government official, a police offer, officer, someone at the airport might say, hand over your liquids. Remember at the airport, liquids are banned once you get through security. So let me write that because it's another great example with the word ban. <laughs> liquids are banned at the airport once you get through security and it's liquids more than three ounces, I believe. Liquids are banned at the airport. So let's say I try to take this bottle of water through security. This is more than three ounces, right? The airport official would say, ma'am, hand over your water. Now I have to give my water to the airport official, but I don't necessarily want to, I'm required to. So we generally use the phrasal verb to hand something over when there is this element of your required to, you might be required to hand something over because your boss requires it, your company requires it, the bank requires it. There could be many different times beyond the government, but just keep that in mind when you are using the phrasal verb to hand something over. So let me write that out. Liquids are banned at the airport. I had to hand over my water bottle, water bottle to the airport official. I don't know what you call the airport <laughs> officials. To be honest, I'm just going to call them airport officials <laughs> to the airport official. So the Chinese government may pressure, try to convince bright dance, try to get them to hand over information. So again, this is saying that bright dance may not want to give the information to the Chinese government, but they may feel required to why? Well, maybe the Chinese government will somehow cause problems for them if they don't. I'm not sure. I just shared that as an example. If you have an idea, feel free to share it in the comments. Hand over information collected from users. So of course, to hand over your personal information that they get because you use the app TikTok that could be used for intelligence or disinformation purposes. Disinformation, you might be wondering what this is. I recognize information. What's disinformation? Disinformation is when you share false information, but you do it on purpose. So to share false information, share false information on purpose. Let's continue on. 
as CNN has previously reported, independent security experts have said that type of access is a possibility. So what type of access are they talking about? And what what is this possibility? That type of access, they're talking about the fact that ByteDance may be required to hand over or to use our vocabulary, that ByteDance may be pressured to hand over your personal information. So that's the type of access, the personal information. And it's a possibility. When something is a possibility, to me, this sounds like a 50-50 chance. Oh, it's a possibility. So if someone asks you, do you think it could rain today? It's a possibility. Do you think we'll get bonuses this month? It's a possibility. 50% we will, 50% we won't. Now you can make this stronger. You could say there's a high possibility that will get bonuses this month. A bonus is money additional to your paycheck. So you get your paycheck and then you get more money, bonus money, usually because performance was really positive. Now, if I say there's a possibility, to me, this, again, like I said, it sounds like 50-50. But of course, if I add the word high possibility, I'm increasing the chance. And to me, this sounds about... 70% possible, maybe even 80%, but I'll say 70% plus that it's possible. So it's more likely than not. What would be the opposite of high possibility? What do you think? If I want to say there's only a 30% chance, what would be the opposite? There's a, what word would I replace? There is a high possibility. There's a <laughs> low possibility. There's a low possibility that we'll get bonuses this month. So that's probably about a 30% or minus. So 30%, 20%, 15%. So notice we have possibility, which is 50-50. You can modify it as high possibility or low possibility. You can use this to talk about receiving something like a bonus. You can use this about the weather, the traffic, really about anything you're making a prediction on. So in this case, they're saying security experts are saying there's only a 50% 50 50 chance that the Chinese government would pressure ByteDance to hand over, to give that information. Though there has been no reported incident of such access to date. So there's no evidence that the Chinese government is actually requiring ByteDance to hand over this information or that ByteDance is handing over the information regardless. There's no actual evidence of that, but the US government is still banning TikTok from government issued phones. Brooke Oberwetter, a spokesperson for TikTok, called such a ban little more than political theater. So by saying it's political theater, it's saying it's, it's a joke. You, you shouldn't take it seriously. It's comical. So it's a way of insulting the government's actions. Why? Well, probably because there is actually no evidence, <laughs> that could be a reason why. So political theater, it's just a way to insult the government, an insult against the government. Now notice here, a ban, a ban. What do you notice that's different from the examples I gave before? The government banned TikTok. Let's talk about the ban. What do you notice? 
Well, my first sentence, the government banned TikTok is a verb. Ban is being used as a verb. The government banned TikTok. This is a verb. To ban. That's the verb. Not bad. <laughs> ban. Now, our other example was... Let's meet to discuss the ban. In this case, the or a ban is a noun. And an easy way to identify if something is a noun or a verb, it's a, if it's a verb, it's going to be conjugated. If it's a noun, it will have an article or it could have a plural form as well. So it's an easy way to identify it. Let's meet to discuss the ban. Now I could say what type of ban, the TikTok, the TikTok ban. Let's meet to discuss the TikTok ban. Let's meet to discuss the smoking ban, the ban. So you will see this as a noun as well. Canada announced it would also be banning the app on government devices. Now here, it would also be banning the app. Right now, is the app banned in Canada? If I say the government announced it would also be banning the app. Today, the app is not banned but is going to be banned in the future. And here it says, as soon as Tuesday. So by the time you're watching this, most likely TikTok has been banned in Canada. Again, present perfect because it's a completed past action with a result in the present. The government, this time of Canada, has banned TikTok. The ban was implemented on Tuesday, and I'll just say March 1st. I don't know when that Tuesday was, but I'll just say March 1st. Has banned TikTok. The ban... This is our noun, right? The ban was implemented. This just means when it started. Implement, you implement a government rule, policy, regulation, in this case, a ban, was implemented on Tuesday, March 1st. Oh, and the European Commission last week issued its own prohibition. This is another way of saying its own ban. They're just deciding to use prohibition, which is the noun form of the word prohibit. Because remember, at the beginning, I said to ban is to not allow, to prohibit. So prohibition is the noun form of the verb prohibit. But we're practicing ban, and honestly, prohibition isn't as common. Ban is the more common natural. So I encourage you to use ban. Last week issued its own ban. In this case, it's a noun on the app on official devices. Remember, this isn't for a regular citizen. This is just for a phone, a device that was issued by the government. So keep that in mind <laughs> on official devices, citing cybersecurity concerns. Over half of all U.S. states have also partially or fully banned TikTok. So notice here, have, have banned. What verb tense is this? The present perfect. And in this case, we're using have because US states is our plural and it would be they. They have banned. Now, partially means that only some of TikTok is banned. I don't know how you partially ban an app, to be honest. I'm not sure. And fully is 100%. So partially would be. 50% of TikTok, there's some things that you can use, 
but some things that you cannot use. So maybe somehow it's possible that you can you can watch TikTok videos, but you're not allowed to upload your own video. I don't know if that's possible, but that would be an example of partially banned. Fully banned is 100%, of course. TikTok on the devices of government employees. Again, this is just government employees. And the U.S. House of Representatives previously announced it had restricted the app on electronic devices managed by the chamber. Okay, it had restricted. This is our past perfect. Now we pass perfect. We use this for a pass action that happens before another pass action. So first it restricted the app on electronic devices and then it banned the app. So restrictions happen first and then the ban came. It had restricted the app. So I wonder, in your country, have they banned TikTok on any devices? Is that something they're talking about? Do you use TikTok? What do you think? Share your comments below and I can't wait to read them. So now what I'll do, that's the end of the article. So what I'll do is I'll read the article from start to finish so you can focus on my pronunciation and follow along with my pronunciation. So let's do that now. Agencies have 30 days to ban TikTok on government devices, White House says. The White House has directed federal agencies that they have 30 days to remove TikTok from all government-issued devices. U.S. officials have raised concerns that the Chinese government could pressure ByteDance to hand over information collected from users that could be used for intelligence or disinformation purposes. As CNN has previously reported, independent security experts have said that type of access is a possibility, though there have been no reported incidents of such access to date. Brooke Oberwetter, a spokesperson for TikTok, called such a ban little more than political theater. Canada announced it would also be banning the app on government devices beginning as soon as Tuesday. And the European Commission last week issued its own prohibition on the app on official devices, citing cybersecurity concerns. Over half of all U.S. states have also partially or fully banned TikTok on the devices of government employees, and the U.S. House of Representatives previously announced it had restricted the app on electronic devices managed by the chamber. Amazing job. Feel free to take a break, and when you're ready, let's move on with the next article. Welcome to our article. This is a lighthearted article about pets in the workplace. So let me read the headline. Pet perks tempt staff back into the workplace. There's already some great vocabulary in this headline right here. For example, the word perk. Do you know what a perk is? A perk, this is a noun, and it's an advantage or something extra. This can be money or goods, and you're given because of your job. So, of course, you get your salary, but perks are additional. For example, I could say, if I want to recruit you to work for my company, I could say, our company offers amazing perks. Now, what are those perks? free lunches. So you get your salary, your paycheck, but you also get free lunches. So that will save you money. So it's like you're getting paid more. Free lunches, free gym memberships, and free language classes. Those are some amazing perks, right? What about you? Do you get any perks from your company? If you do, share some examples in the chat below. Okay, so pet perks. So these are perks related to pets. <laughs> pet perks tempt staff back into the office. So let's take a look at this. Tempt. This is a verb. Tempt. 
And this means to make someone want to have or do something. So in our specific topic, they're talking about wanting the staff, the employees to come back to the office. So to not work at home and to work physically in the office. So how are they going to tempt you? How are they going to make you want to? It's another way of saying convince, tempt you, convince you, make you want to. Well, they can offer you some perks and in this case, some pet perks. Do you have any pets? Do you think pet perks would be a good way to tempt someone to come into the office? Let's continue on with our article. Mr. Griffin, who I assume is this man in the picture with these two adorable dogs. Mr. Griffin, who is head of IT for marketing agency Rise at 7, turns up at its Sheffield headquarters with his furry friends, Jesse and Oscar. So furry friends, this is a cute and casual way of saying the word pet. So you could say, I have pets. I have two pets. I have two furry friends. And those are your pets, of course. So I'll write that here pets. And the names of his dogs are Jesse and Oscar. I don't know which one is which. Okay. Now let's take a look at this. He turns up at its Sheffield headquarters. So a headquarter is the main office of a a company. For example, Google's headquarter is in California. I don't know if that is true or not. It's just an example. So this company's headquarters is in Sheffield. I don't know where that is. Now he turns up at its Sheffield headquarters, the location of the office turns up. This is another way of saying arrive. It's a casual way, but a very common way. And the verb turn up is a phrasal verb. This is very commonly used. For example, what time did you turn up at the party last night? What time did you turn up? You can use this in more casual situations, but here they're using it in a more professional situation, but this is a more casual, informal article. This isn't a scholarly article or an academic article. So that's why they're using this casual phrasal verb turn up. Let's continue on. Rise allowing dogs. Remember his company is called rise at seven. So they're just shortening it to rise, rise, allowing dogs, the company allowing dogs in the office has meant that I've been able to take both my collies collies. This is a type of dog. So this is the breed, the breed. So we use that specific word breed breed of dog. And that means the type of dog. And here the breed is collies, which is actually short for what are they? I believe they're border collies. Border collies is the long name. And then people just commonly call them collies. So I just Googled it to make sure. And yes, the breed is border collie, but I spelled it wrong. So I need to correct that and notice border collie dog breed. And then you can look at the different pictures for this breed or find out more information. So I just corrected the spelling here. Now what's your favorite breed of dog? I really love labs, which is short for Labrador retriever, but everybody just calls them the short form, which is labs. What's your favorite breed of dog? Feel free to share that in the comments. Okay. So here, this man, Mr. Griffin, he can take his two dogs, 
Jesse and Oscar into the office. So that his company allowing him to do that, that is a perk. So here I could say our cough, our company offers amazing perks like you can bring your dog into the office. That is an example of a perk for this company. Let's continue on. They get to meet new people. In this case, the they is the dogs. <laughs> they get to meet new people, have new experiences, and I get to spend more time in work with my colleagues. So there's some benefits for the dogs. They get to socialize, meet new people, and there's some benefits for him, Mr. Griffin, which is he gets to interact with his colleagues. He gets to work with his colleagues. So do you think bringing a pet into the office is a good idea? Is that a good perk? Would that tempt using our vocabulary, would that tempt you to return to work if you were allowed to bring your furry friend, your pet? Okay, let's continue on. It's a complete win-win situation. Now, I already explained what the win-win is. Remember, he listed some benefits for the dogs. The dogs win. They get to socialize. He wins because he gets to work with his colleagues. And the company wins because the company has the employees at work, which is what the company wants. So it's a win-win. Everybody gets what they want. So this is a good expression to have, especially when both parties have an advantage. It's a win-win. It's a win-win situation. I like this. As far as I'm concerned, this is a great way to express an opinion. Let me share an opinion. As far as I'm concerned, and then you can list your opinion. Perks are a great way to tempt people to return to work, to return to in-person work, of course, in-person work, as far as I'm concerned. And then this is simply my opinion. Now, you can put our expression at the beginning or you can add it at the end. So you can state your opinion. Perks are a great way to tempt people to return to in-person work, as far as I'm concerned, and then you can just add it. So you can add it at the beginning or at the end. So feel free to practice sharing your opinion related to perks or pet perks in the comments and use this expression. As far as, notice we have our verb to be. I'm concerned. So if you were going to talk about a group opinion, you could say as far as we're concerned, as far as he's concerned, Mr. Griffin, right? As far as I'm concerned. So don't forget your verb to be and to conjugate that. Let's continue on. Like millions of other people, Mr. Griffin got his dogs during the pandemic. Did you get any pets during the pandemic? Actually, I did. I got a cat during the pandemic and then I got a second cat a year later. So now I have two cats, but bringing cats into the office is not a good perk because cats are not meant to go into the office. They wouldn't enjoy that at all. <laughs> okay. With most of us home working, home working, to be honest, I don't see it written like this. When I saw this home working, I thought of doing homework. This is not an expression I commonly see. What I commonly see is working from home working from home. Now this is an article from the BBC. So perhaps this expression homeworking is common in British English. I don't know if that is true or not, but in American English, honestly, I have never seen homeworking. I thought doing homework for me, 
I would say with most of us working from home, working from home. So if you are learning American English, I would recommend using working from home. With most of us working from home at the time, as a result of lockdowns, there was a huge surge, surge. Surge is an increase. And when you say surge, it generally represents a sudden, a quick increase and a a big increase, an increase quickly and in the amount of the increase is quite large. So it would go from 10 to 80 in two hours. That would be a surge. We see this a lot with gas prices, right? Gas prices have increased quickly, but the amount of the increase is a lot. It didn't just increase by a couple cents. It increased by a couple dollars increase. So gas prices have surged. Gas prices have surged. There was a huge surge in pet ownership. So during the pandemic, many people bought pets. So the amount of people buying pets increased quickly and the number was quite large as people wanted increased companionship, companionship. While having dogs in the workplace is likely to remain a rarity, a rarity, a rarity, this comes from the adverb of frequency, rare, rarely, which means not, not a lot, not frequently. So they're saying that dogs in the workplace is not going to be common. It's going to be a rarity, something that doesn't happen a lot. This example is part of a wider trend. Companies introducing new incentives. An incentive could be a perk. An incentive is just something to try to get you to do something specific. And a perk is a type of incentive. So a perk is a type of incentive to try to make staff happier to come into the office more often. Job search engine Adzuna, I'm not familiar with this site, Adzuna, says that the number of adverts, this is another difference probably between British English and American English. We don't say adverts in American English. We just say ads. The number of ads, which is short for advertisement, advertisement. So we just take ad from that advertisement. The number of ads that highlight in office perks has now more than doubled. So we could probably say has surged, has surged since before the start of the pandemic. So now people are searching for in office perks as part of their job search criteria. They want perks. <laughs> the increased incentives range from free exercise and language classes. That would be a great perk for you, right? If your company offered free English training to complimentary food and subsidized childcare. Okay. So they range from to, from to. When you use the word range from, you're going to have one end from this to this, and you're going to have a range, right? So you could say our prices range from $100, so that is the lowest price, to $500. That's the range of the prices from Two. Let me write that for you. Our prices range from $100 to $500. So here they use range from two. Now notice this word, complementary food. Complementary food. What does that mean? It means free. <laughs> it's just another way of saying 
free. Free food, subsidized. If your childcare is subsidized, it is not free because that would probably be very expensive. It is not free, but it is reduced. So the the cost is reduced, which means likely the employer will pay some of the child care, but you still have to pay the majority of the child care. That would be subsidized. So in this case, it's reduced, but complimentary, that means free. Let's continue on. Employees aren't in a rush to return to the office, which means they're not doing it quickly. Because if you're in a rush, it means you're moving quickly. So rush, moving quickly. But notice, <laughs> they are not in a rush to return to the office. So what about you? Are you in a rush to return to the office or no? After enjoying the improved work-life balance that came from remote working, remote working, of course, is another way of saying working from home. But remote is a broader category because home, I'm home right now. I'm working from home. But if I were in a hotel room in another city, but I was recording this lesson, I'm not technically working from home because I don't live in that hotel in a different city, but I am working remotely. So working from home is a category of remote work. Says Paul Lewis, chief marketing officer at Adzuna. As a result, companies are desperate to find new and unique ways to lure employees back. Lure is another way of saying tempt, tempt, to tempt. The definitions are slightly different between tempt and lure, but they have the same overall meaning. To lure is to persuade someone to do, to do something or go somewhere. To persuade someone is to try to convince someone, to try to get someone to do something or to go somewhere, usually by offering them something. Hey, if you come to the restaurant with me, I'll buy you lunch. I'm trying to lure you to the restaurant with me. I'm trying to tempt you to come to the restaurant with me. So they're very similar. Tempt to me is more common because honestly, when I hear lure, we generally use it in a more negative situation. For example, the man lured the child into the, into his van and then obviously something negative happened, right? So when I hear lure, there's usually a negative result as that person is persuaded to go somewhere or do something. Or the scammer lured me in and then stole all my money. So although the meanings are generally the same, I specifically hear tempt more in negative context. Use more when the result is negative. And in the news, often the result can be very negative, talking about murder or death, for example. But tempt is generally more neutral. I don't hear it specifically used in negative. And when I hear the word tempt, I don't think instantly of negative news stories. So because of that, I would probably just use the word tempt. At central London-based financial planning firm, First Wealth, ooh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> so at the company First Wealth, and this is just information about them, where are they located? They're located in central London. That's where they're based. Based is another word for located. We're a Canadian-based company. We're a North American-based company. We're a central London based company. And then, well, what type of company? A financial planning firm. 
firm is just another word for company commonly used with financial services, lawyers, very specific companies, but it's just another word for company. At central London-based financial planning firm, First Wealth. That's a mouthful. <laughs> At the company First Wealth, workers are being tempted back, again, tempted back. So they are trying to convince them to do something attempt to convince someone to do something back via free sessions at a nearby gym. So this is the perk, the free sessions at a nearby gym. This is a perk, an example of a perk. Let me write this here, perk. This is a perk. I wrote it as a full sentence because this is a noun. So I want you to see that as the singular noun, you need the article. This is a perk. But of course, with plural nouns, we don't use the article. So I could say these are perks. Now, of course, this is just one perk. So we need more than one, but I'm just showing you grammatically. We don't need that article here, but because this is singular, we need that article. So how about this as a perk? Would this tempt you to go back to the office if you got free sessions at a gym? So free gym membership. Beauty treatments are another incentive that companies are booking to get their staff excited about coming into the office. So this is another perk. This is a perk. Is a perk and the perk is beauty treatments. That's an interesting one. I can't imagine what kind of beauty treatments you would get. I guess it's not in the office. It could be after work on your lunch break. You could go get a manicure or a pedicure or whatever you want. So beauty treatments are another, you could just say are another perk. They're using the word incentive. Remember perk is a type of incentive. Beauty treatments are another perk that companies are booking to get their staff excited about coming into the office. So you could also say that companies are booking to tempt their staff into the office, tempt their staff into the office. And that's the end of the article. So now what I'll do is I'll go to the top and I'll read the article from start to finish and you can follow along with my pronunciation. Pet perks tempt staff back into the office. Mr. Griffin, who is head of IT for marketing agency Rise at 7, turns up at its Sheffield headquarters with his furry friends Jesse and Oscar. Rise allowing dogs in the office has meant that I've been able to take both my colleagues in, he says. They get to meet new people, have new experiences, and I get to spend more time in work with my colleagues. It's a complete win-win situation as far as I'm concerned. Like millions of other people, Mr. Griffin got his dogs during the pandemic. With most of us home working at the time, as a result of lockdowns, there was a huge surge in pet ownership as people wanted increased companionship. While having dogs in the workplace is likely to remain a rarity, this example is part of a wider trend. Companies introducing new incentives to try to make staff happier to come into the office more often. Job search engine Azuna says that the number of adverts that highlight in-office perks has now more than doubled since before the start of the pandemic. The increased incentives range from free exercise and language classes to complimentary food and subsidized health care. Employees aren't in a rush to return to the office after enjoying the improved work-life balance that came from remote working says Paul Lewis, Chief Marketing Officer at Adzuna. As a result, companies are desperate to find new and unique ways to lure employees back to the office.
At central London-based financial planning firm, First Wealth, workers are being tempted back via free sessions at a nearby gym. Beauty treatments are another incentive that companies are booking to get their staff excited about coming into the office. Amazing job. Feel free to take a break. And when you're ready, let's move on with the next article. Our headline, lab grown meat, beef for dinner without killing animals or the environment. So in this picture, as you can see, this looks like a piece of meat, right? But clearly this is also a lab. So this is meat that was made in a lab and no animal had to be killed. Wow. The future is here. So let's learn about this very interesting topic. Imagine biting into a juicy burger that was produced without killing animals. Let's take a look at this adjective, juicy. It describes the burger. Notice my pronunciation, burger, 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 into a juicy burger. When something is juicy, this is an adjective that normally describes food, and it means it has a lot of juice, which you can think of as a lot of liquid. So think of a piece of fruit like a pineapple and all the liquid in that pineapple. So a pineapple is juicy. A mango is juicy. What's another juicy fruit? <laughs> Can you think of any others? Share it in the comments. So imagine biting into a juicy burger. And I should note that generally in terms of describing meat, juicy is a positive quality. You want your burger to be juicy. The opposite is dry. So let me write this opposite of juicy is dry because when something is dry, there's no liquid at all. Now, generally this is used as a negative. Oh, the burger was really dry. The meat was dry. It's a negative. So a juicy burger that was produced without killing animals. Notice here we have our ing, our gerund form of the verb. Why? Because without is a preposition and we use the gerund verb after prepositions without killing animals. Meat grown in a laboratory. Notice the pronunciation here because there is a difference between American English, which I teach, and British English. In American English, laboratory, laboratory. But notice in the headline, they're referring to lab grown meat. If you can't remember the correct pronunciation, just call it a lab because the majority of the time we do call it a lab It's the short form for the word laboratory. I'm going to the lab. I need to go to the lab. Can you drop me off at the lab? Okay. Meat grown in a laboratory from cultured cells, which I imagine is what we see in this image here, is turning that vision into a reality. When you turn a vision into a reality, it's another way of saying it becomes real. So right now, for example, Elon Musk is turning his vision of going to Mars into a reality, right? Every day he's getting closer and closer with the actions that he's taking. And right now you, by watching this video and learning these advanced expressions, you're turning your vision of speaking English fluently and confidently into a reality, right? So let me write that down for you. So here it is. And notice again, we have that ing or gerund verb because we have the preposition of. I'm turning my vision of speaking English fluently and confidently into a reality. Several startups are developing lab grown beef, pork, poultry, and seafood. So these are the different types of meat that are being developed in the lab, the laboratory. If widely adopted, widely adopted, this means that many people are 
using the product or service. And in this case, the product is lab grown meat. So using would be purchasing it, right? That would mean it's widely adopted. So many people are using it. Many people are using it. And notice if widely adopted, well, the subject is lab grown meat, but it, they just placed it after, but you could also say if lab grown meat is widely adopted, and then you could continue on with your sentence. So just an alternative way of writing that. Lab-grown meat, also called clean meat, so this is an alternative name, could eliminate much of the cruel, unethical treatment of animals raised for food. It could also reduce the considerable environmental costs of meat production. Okay, notice they're using the modal verb could. It could reduce the environmental cost. It could eliminate... They're doing that because this is right now a hypothetical situation because it, it doesn't actually exist in the market fully. It's still being developed today. So could as a modal verb is used to show possibility, possibility or potential, possibility, potential. It doesn't mean it will happen. And remember, because it's a modal verb, it's followed by the base verb, not the infinitive. That's why it's could eliminate and not could to eliminate. So modal plus base verb, that's the sentence structure. All right, it could also reduce the considerable. This is a nice adjective. Considerable as an adjective means large when we're talking about the degree. So how much of an environmental cost is there? If I say there's a considerable environmental cost, it's a large amount of environmental cost. So large, an alternative word for it would be significant. You could also say significant environmental cost of meat production. So you could say in a more everyday context, I have a considerable amount of work to do. So it's telling you how much, a large amount. The meat is made by first taking a muscle sample from an animal, of course, muscle. <laughs> now, muscles are all over our body. I'm just pointing at a common one. I don't have very big muscles, but there's a muscle there. Technicians, these are the people who work in a lab, a lab tech. Ah, so we also commonly shorten the word technician because it's very common to casually say, I'm a lab tech. I'm a laboratory technician. Now, of course, if you're writing your formal resume, you wouldn't say lab tech, you would use the full form, but in casual conversation or speech, you would definitely say, oh, I'm a lab tech. Technicians collect stem cells from the tissue. So within muscle, there is tissue. And then within that tissue, there are cells, stem cells from the tissue, multiply them dramatically. So dramatically is a adverb like significantly, dramatically. Again, it means to a large degree. I could also say considerably as an adverb. So it means quite quickly in this context because we're talking about multiplying. So to multiply means you would go from two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, and then be on and on and on. But it does that dramatically. So it, the, it happens very quickly and in large quantities. So you could go from two stem cells to a thousand stem cells in a small amount of time. So that would be dramatically and allow them to differentiate into primitive fibers. So fibers are like strands of hair almost, but they're 
within your, your muscle, your tissue fibers that then bulk up. In the context of fibers or tissue or muscle, bulk up means to become larger. So you see this a lot in the sports world. If you're about to go to a sports competition, you would probably want to bulk up, which means you would want your muscles to become larger. Before your competition, you would go to the gym and you would go to the gym a lot because you want to bulk up. It's not just your arm muscles. It could be muscles all over your body. And you'll see advertisements on TV for take this pill and it will help you bulk up, which means it will help your, you and your muscles, your body become larger. So let me just write that to become larger, but in the context of your body, your muscles to become larger body muscles. I don't want to bulk up, <laughs> but some people clearly do for different reasons. Then bulk up to form muscle tissue. Moza Meat says that one tissue sample from a cow can yield enough muscle tissue to make 80,000 quarter pounders. Wow. So yield means to produce in the sense of result in, produce, result in, produce, let me write this, produce, result in. So one tissue sample can yield, produce, result in 80,000 burgers. That's insane. <laughs> Quarter pounder, if you didn't know, is a burger. It's a burger that is made with a quarter pound of meat. A burger made from a quarter pound of meat. If you like burgers and if you eat at McDonald's, you'll know that a name of a burger at McDonald's is a quarter pounder. You can order a quarter pounder at McDonald's. That is a lot of burgers. Wow. A number of the startups, I think they used this before. I didn't mention it. You probably know this. It's a very common term these days, but a startup is a company that has recently been established. It's a very young company, young in the sense of it's a new company. So a company that has recently been established. A number of the startups say they expect to have products for sale within the next few years. Now, to be honest, this article is quite old. I think it's from 2018. So the next few years could be any day now, this year, next year. So this is going to be coming to your grocery stores. What do you think? Would you buy lab grown meat knowing that it could reduce environmental damage and it could reduce harm to animals? Is that something that you would want to support? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Share your comments about lab grown meat. If you would want to, to eat it or not in the comments, but clean meat. Remember this was an alternative name to lab grown meat, but clean meat will have to overcome a number of barriers if it is to be commercially viable. So if something is commercially viable, viable is another way of saying successful. And how is something commercially successful? Well, it has to be profitable in order for a company to be viable, successful, they need to make enough money to cover their expenses, which means profitable. So although they're saying commercially viable, it's just another way of really saying profitable because that is what a commercially viable company is profitable. But clean meat will have to overcome a number of barriers. A barrier is something that prevents you from getting somewhere. You might be driving down 
the road and then you get to a bridge and they're doing repairs to the bridge. So they put a barrier in front of the bridge, which could be pylons or just a piece of, of wood across the, the bridge, but it prevents you from going any further. It's a barrier. So you will encounter barriers when you're commuting, you're driving, and you can also count, encounter barriers in terms of problems, difficulties, or challenges because they prevent you from, from progressing, from going further. And overcome is another way of seeing solve. So you solve, eliminate, overcome. Solve, eliminate, get rid of, overcome. You find the solution to. Let's continue on. Two are cost and taste. Two, to what? <laughs> you always have to think about what you've read before. And they were just talking about a number of barriers. So now they're telling us about two of these barriers. So you could absolutely say two of these barriers are cost and taste. In 2013, when a burger made from lab grown meat was presented to journalists, the patty, this is just another way of saying burger, the burger patty, the burger. Generally think of McDonald's or any fast food restaurant. When you get a burger, it has the bun, the patty, and things like ketchup, mustard, onions, pickles, cheese. So all of that together forms a complete burger. And then the meat in the burger is referred to a patty, the burger patty. So that's the piece of meat in a burger. Let me just write that for you. Burger patty, the piece of meat in a burger, because remember a burger is not just the meat, it's the bun and all the other toppings as well. The patty costs more than $300,000. Oh, that's one expensive burger to produce and was overly dry. Ah, here we have that adjective. What's the opposite of dry? Good test. You learn this at the beginning. The opposite of dry is juicy. And what did I say? Is dry a positive thing or a negative thing to describe a burger as dry? It's a negative thing. It's a criticism of that burger. It means it didn't taste very good. And by saying overly, overly means too much than you wanted. So overly more than you wanted or needed. You could say the meeting was long. And this is more just stating a fact. The meeting was long. That doesn't necessarily tell you if that's a positive thing or a negative thing. It's just more of a factual thing. But if you say the meeting was overly long, now this is negative because overly means more than you wanted or needed. Let's continue. To receive market approval, clean meat will have to be proved safe to eat. So market approval means it's approved to sell at the grocery store. The government says, yes, you can sell this product at the grocery store. That would be market approval. Meanwhile, traditional meat producers are pushing back. When you push back on something, generally a, a rule, a policy, a decision, it means you're saying, no, I don't want that or you're saying, no, we shouldn't do that. You're pushing back. So you're voicing an opposing opinion to push back. Voicing an opposing 
opinion or view or option. So maybe your boss wants everyone to work an hour later every single day. <laughs> That's his new idea. Hey team, I have this great idea. We're all going to work an extra hour every single day. But everyone said, no, I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. We shouldn't do that. That is pushing back. So the the employees push back. They said, no, I don't want to do that. We shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. That would be pushing back. So the traditional meat producers, the farmers are pushing back, arguing that the lab generated products are not meat at all and should not be labeled as such. So when you go to the grocery store and you buy a burger, they shouldn't say it's meat if it was grown in a lab. What do you think? Do you agree with that? Despite these challenges, the clean meat companies are forging ahead. So to forge ahead means that they are continuing or progressing despite difficulties. So continue progress despite difficulties. So in a English learning context, you could say Fra learning phrasal verbs is very difficult, but I'm going to forge ahead, which means you're not going to quit. You're going to continue studying, continue learning phrasal verbs, continue using phra phrasal verbs, even though there are difficulties involved. If they can succeed in creating authentic tasting products, so that would be a, a burger patty that actually tastes like a burger. It's juicy. It has the flavor, the texture. That would be authentic. Authentic tasting products that are also affordable. <laughs> Remember how expensive it was. Clean meat could make our daily eating habits more ethical and environmentally sustainable. And remember, they're again using that modal could because at this point when this article was written, clean meat was not available in the public. So this is just a possibility, possibility or potential. Clean meat could make our daily eating habits more ethical and environmentally sustainable. I personally think this is a very interesting topic, so I hope you enjoyed the article and learning about this. So now what I'll do is I'll go to the top and I'll read the article from start to finish, and this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Lab-grown meat. Beef for dinner without killing animals or the environment. Imagine biting into a juicy burger that was produced without killing animals. Meat grown in a laboratory from cultured cells is turning that vision into a reality. Several startups are developing lab-grown beef, pork, poultry, and seafood. If widely adopted, lab-grown meat, also called clean meat, could eliminate much of the cruel, unethical treatment of animals raised for food. It could also reduce the considerable environmental costs of meat production. The meat is made by first taking a muscle sample from an animal. Technicians collect stem cells from the tissue, multiply them dramatically, and allow them to differentiate into primitive fibers that then bulk up to form muscle tissue. Moza Meat says that one tissue sample from a cow can yield enough muscle tissue to make 80,000 quarter pounders. A number of the startups say they expect to have products for sale within the next few years, but clean meat will have to overcome a number of barriers if it is to be commercially viable. Two are costs and tastes. In 2013, when a burger made from lab-grown meat was presented to journalists, the patty cost more than $300,000 to produce and was overly dry. To receive market approval, clean meat will have to be proved safe to eat. 
Meanwhile, traditional meat producers are pushing back, arguing that the lab-generated products are not meat at all and should not be labeled as such. Despite these challenges, the clean meat companies are forging ahead. If they can succeed in creating authentic tasting products that are also affordable, clean meat could make our daily eating habits more ethical and environmentally sustainable. Did you like this lesson? Do you want me to make more lessons just like this? If you do, then put more, 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 put more, more, more in the comments and I'll keep making lessons just like this. And of course, make sure you like this video, share it with your friends and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And why don't you keep improving your vocabulary with this lesson right now?